gaming for better or worse is a lifestyle. A lot of gamers are deeply invested and it becomes a part of their identity. We have always played games, before agriculture, before the wheel, perhaps even before we were human, we played. We wrestled, we raced, we pretended to hunt. Games taught us how to be with other people. They showed us how to think differently and how to think the same. As humans evolved, so did our games. Before we could write, we made dice out of animal bones. 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians carved board games out of wood. 1,500 years ago, we were playing chess in India. We have invented tens of thousands of games, and over the millennia, virtually all humans have played at something. But now, suddenly, the game has changed. More than a part of growing up, more than a way to be social, gaming, video gaming, is now a way of life. 60% of Americans play a video game every day. Some play all day. And some of the best are getting rich, very rich, by playing for a crowd. The industry is less than 50 years old, but video games bring in nearly twice as much money as the movie industry, the NFL, the NBA, and baseball combined. The real revolution may be still to come. And it started here in the Bay Area because of a big white lie and a little white ball. The very first video games weren't created to be played. They were meant to show what computers could do. In 1952, A.S. Douglas developed Knots and Crosses at the University of Cambridge. It simulated tic-tac-toe. In 1958, American physicist William Higginbotham developed Tennis for Two at a government lab in New York. Both were built on early computers that were so big and complex, no one but an engineer could play. Then came Space War. Historian Chris Garcia. Space War had been written at MIT in the early 60s, but Digital Equipment Corporation had sent around the paper tape of the game all over the country uh, as a part of the Users Society, Geekus they called it. And what happened was, all sorts of people played it, and all sorts of people tried to put it onto their new machine. One of the first versions of Space War made it to the Bay Area. In 1971, Stanford graduate Bill Pitts and a friend, Hugh Tuck, loaded the game into one of the new, smaller computers called the PDP-11 minicomputer. Because of the anti-war sentiment on campus, they changed the name from Space War to Galaxy Game. They added a coin box and it was an instant hit. So it was only deployed, as far as I've ever heard, uh, in actually in the Tresseter Union at Stanford. And for years it was played, and it was arguably one of the first coin-operated video games that we would sort of see them today. They proved a coin-operated video game could work, but it was still too expensive for mass production. That problem would be solved by someone else. 
Nolan Bushnell, in particular, was everywhere. He knew everything that was going on. And here's a guy whose superpower, really, is taking every input and realizing what the great idea is at the heart of it. In the 1960s, Nolan Bushnell came to the Bay Area after graduating from the University of Utah. He worked at Ampex, one of the first big electronic companies in Silicon Valley. Bushnell had seen Space War as a student, and it gave him an idea. At Ampex, he and a co-worker, Ted Dabney, created Computer Space. Computer Space was also an implementation of Space War, and it was the game that sort of started the idea of the sort of the classic arcade game, standing, video screen, uh, button controls. It was pretty hard to play, actually. But that was sort of the beginning. Bushnell made a deal with a small company to build and distribute the game. Computer Space failed. Al Alcorn met Bushnell and Dabney at Ampex. Nolan and Ted Dabney created this game over at a little company down the street called Nutting Associates and uh, showed it to us. And, uh, but then Nolan got upset with them about how to run the company and said, I'm going to do my own. And that's when Atari got started. In 1972, Atari had two employees, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. The first person they hired was Al Alcorn, a Berkeley graduate and engineer. I was 24 years old, so I wasn't thinking about anything beyond where my next meal was coming from. Nolan and Ted came by uh, and took me to lunch one day and uh, offered me this job. On his first day of work, Alcorn arrived at a small office in Sunnyvale. We were in one of those, you know, down in Silicon Valley, down in Santa Clara, uh, kind of a garage space, maybe a couple thousand square feet. It was just the three of us. There was uh, Ted's brother, and Nolan had hired his babysitter, Cynthia, to answer the phones after she came back from high school. And if someone was calling for Nolan, she was instructed to make him wait to make it seem like we had a bigger place and there were more people. That year, Atari still didn't have a game. Bushnell went to a trade show and found his inspiration. There's the famous story of him going to a trade show and seeing a demonstration of a machine uh, called the Magnavox Odyssey. And seeing a version of ping pong played on that and then going back and telling Al, uh, Al, we need a version of uh, ping pong. To motivate Alcorn, Bushnell told him a little lie about a deal to make a ping pong game. He wanted to challenge me, so he told me he had this contract from General Electric for a home game, which had to be really cheap, like $15 in parts. So I put this thing together as simply as I could, but I had way too many parts for a home game, but no one didn't seem to mind, and, and I made the game playable with some of the speed up and the angles of the ball and stuff like that. It took three months for Alcorn to design the prototype. The game he created was Pong. As soon as they had a working game, Bushnell put it into Andy Capp's tavern in Sunnyvale. We just watched people play it, because I, I just think, my dear God, it's the only coin-op game ever made that required two people. There was no one player version. It had to have two people, and there were no instructions, just the word Pong, two knobs, and a coin box. I mean, like, what are the chances that would... Well, <laughs> it did. <laughs> it really took off. And once that happened, the world changed. In a matter of days, the bar manager called to say the machine was broken. Alcorn wasn't surprised. He built the game so quickly, he figured there was a wiring problem. In fact, the game was too popular. So I opened up the coin box to flip the little micro switch because I didn't want to waste my own quarter. Uh, the door opens up and all this money falls out of the thing. I'm going, wow. So I split the tape with the uh, bartender and put the rest in my pockets and next day came to work and I said, I found out the problem. What was it? Too much money. I'm guessing it might have been 100 bucks, 150 bucks, something like that. It's a big pile of quarters. In its first year, Atari made $1 million on Pong. The company moved to Los Gatos 
and Alcorn was now the vice president of engineering. In 1973, the Atari team traveled to Japan to meet with a distribution company. On a side trip, Alcorn took a boat tour of Hakone Lake. It was there he realized what Atari had done. Hakone Lake is a beautiful high mountain lake in Japan. With, and this was 1973. All the culture, and there were not many a Americans up there at that point. I remember people looking at us. I had a beard, and that's unusual. Anyway, on that boat, we were on a tour boat going across the lake. There was a Pong machine. And I'm thinking, oh my god, what have I done? Here's this beautiful land with this ancient culture and I <laughs> the Pong machine. Pong made Atari the first global video game company. College students wanted to work there including a very young Steve Jobs. In walks this 18-year-old, I think he was 18, about that 17 or 18, old enough to hire, I guess. Uh, and uh, he's dropped out of Reed College. I said, is Reed an engineering school? He said, no, no, it's a, a literary kind of a th thing. I go, okay, uh, what's my motivation here? Well, I got this friend over at Hewlett Packard Steve Wozniak, well, good does that do me, you know? And, but he was enthused. In 1976, Bushnell had another idea for a game. He asked Steve Jobs to build it. Jobs had to keep the number of chips to a minimum to keep costs down. Jobs couldn't do it, but he gets Woz to come in, and Woz does it in like a week, three days, nonstop. And I walk in and Steve says, hey, look at this. And there's a finished game. It wasn't even on the schedule. How the hell did this get here? It was like unbelievable. And I looked at the schematic and I said, you did not do it, Steve uh, uh, Jobs. Uh, I can't understand what happened. This had to be was. That game was Breakout, and it was a hit. It helped cement the business relationship between Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In 1976, Wozniak built the Apple I computer. He and Jobs started Apple. That same year, Bushnell sold Atari. In 1977, Atari released a home video game console called the Atari 2600. It had interchangeable cartridges, and that is super key with almost all of the other gaming systems prior. What Atari did and did beautifully was they got third party folk to make games for the 2600. And that was game changing. And that has defined success for a console ever since. When I created Pong, there was no video game industry. We revolutionized it by really creating the video game industry, making a, a profitable, desirable business. And because that industry started here, the Bay Area has become a magnet for the greatest minds in gaming. A teenager who proved you could make a living by playing video games. The beauty queen who managed professional players and changed how American gamers compete. The corner, One of America's it. first shoutcasters who pioneered play-by-play -play and started a new profession in gaming. And the game designer who found the secret that keeps people playing for hours on end. Al Alcorn shares more stories about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, including what happened when Jobs came back from India and how he and Woz opened their first Apple business account.